Uh, thank you and good morning. Um, yeah, so a um, little bit more quick background uh, about me. I started uh, my career as an astrophysicist, uh, studying how magnetic fields help develop and form galaxies and powerful outflows from galaxies. Um, and now uh, I'm a data scientist. Uh, working at Agero, or company here in Boston, uh, with a mission of helping people, um, helping make the roads safer uh, for drivers. Whether you're broken down on the side of the road and you need a tow, or whether you've been in a crash and you need emergency services, which um, that's really my focus, is developing technologies to enable uh, crash detection on um, your smartphone so that we can get you uh, help when you need it as quickly as possible um, and sort of distribute that technology to, to anybody with a smartphone, which is pretty much anybody these days. Um, and so that kind of leads me to the topic of my talk today, which is um, mobile sensing. <clears throat> and by mobile sensing, I mean using sensors embedded in a, a mobile device, whether that's a smartphone or whatever, to make inferences about uh, the device itself, the device's user, the environment around the, the device. Um, and mobile sensing is pretty much everywhere these days. We, uh, uh, our watches count our steps and our heartbeats. Our, uh, we waggle the controllers of our game, game consoles now. Um, hobbyists can build really sophisticated and inexpensive mobile sensing platforms using uh, the Arduino or, or Raspberry Pi uh, platforms. Um, mobile sensing is going, going to enable new ways of interacting with the digital world with uh, sort of new uh, augmented reality and spatial computing uh, platforms like the, this here is the Magic Leap, if you're not familiar with it, that's, they're supposed to be launching developer kits later this year. I'm very excited about that. Um, and then, of course, your, your, your smartphone. Everybody here probably has a smartphone in their pocket, and um, it is packed with, uh, with sensors. Um, you're probably familiar with some of these sensors. Of course, the GPS, maybe some of you used it to navigate here uh, today. Um, there's a, a package of sensors that are typically referred to as the inertial measurement unit. That's the accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer, sort of working in concert to measure motion of the phone and orientation of the phone. Uh, and then you have a barometer for pressure uh, measurement, um, proximity sensor so you can turn the screen off when you're talking on the, on the phone, um, a light sensor so you can dim or brighten the screen. Um, and of course you have cameras and microphones and there are all kinds of other sensors um, that are in uh, other devices or, or some smartphones uh, add uh, additional sensors, but this is kind of the basic set that you're usually working with on a smartphone. Um, so why did we put all these sensors in our phones to begin with? I think early on it was really for user experience uh, to make new ways of interacting and, and inputting to the phone. So you could like tilt your phone to drive a car in a game or when you tilt the phone, you reorient the screens. Really nice, nice handy feature if you don't have a keyboard or something. Um, and you know, for navigation, you have this thing in your pocket that you can use to help you get around. Why not add GPS? It makes it even better. Um, but as the sensors got, uh, like as mobile phones became more ubiquitous, sensors got cheaper, um, smaller, and we could do, and computing power and mobile devices got better, battery life got better. So we can do more with these sensors than we, today, than we could, you know, five years ago. Um, you have virtual reality in your pocket. Um, you have uh, health tracker applications, really uh, powerful new um, imaging technology um, or capabilities. Um, and a lot of people, so these are all sort of things that are built into your phone or your operating system now, but a lot of you know, entrepreneurs or, or scientists are doing um, a lot of other things with mobile sensing. Um, like at Agero, we're using uh, mobile sensing for a particular sort of suite of um, technologies that are commonly referred to as mobile telematics, which is using um, sensors in a mobile device to measure uh, the motion of a, of a vehicle. 
So I mentioned before we use this for crash detection and also reconstruction. So if you've been in a crash, we can detect it, but then we can also help people sort of figure out what happened during that crash. Um, for risk assessment and coaching, helping people understand what behaviors that they have when they're driving um, are uh, you know, riskier behaviors and help them understand how to be safer so that hopefully they don't get in a crash in the first place. You can also use it for fleet management, tracking where cars are and how far they've driven and um, for fuel consumption and things like that. Um, so for any sort of, any data scientist sort of lives and dies by data and we needed a lot of it for some of the work that we were doing and we developed an application and um, launched it in uh, December 2016 called MileUp. We launched it in uh, the App Store and the Google Play Store. It was really a crowdsourcing experimental, uh, mobile telematics experimental data platform where we were effectively rewarding people to drive and in, we were re rewarding them for driving with our app and providing data to us for our, for our studies. Um, the data, the app would log your driving data from all the different sensors that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, while you were driving completely in the background, you didn't really have to think about it. And um, yeah, we, we ended up collecting uh, a few billion miles of driving data with from hundreds of thousands of users. It was a real success and it's been a ton of fun to play with the data. Um, so, uh, I'll talk now about some, in a little bit more detail, some of the data that you get from, the, from these sensors if you wanted to start you know, playing around with mobile sensing applications yourself. And I'll talk about the capabilities of some of the sensors, mostly focusing on the IMU and the GPS, as well as some of the pitfalls that you might not, you know, these sensors seem pretty intuitive, but as you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, it become, there are some things you should be aware of. Um, when you're working with, uh, with these types of sensors. So GPS, of course, will measure your position as a function of time on the Earth. Um, here's like a sample uh, path from start to end here that somebody took driving through a city. Um, and so we use this for you know, knowing where people are driving and when they're driving in particular places, what road are you on, et cetera. You get accuracy up to five meters uh, or so. Um, you could sample once a second. So it's pretty high fidelity if you're tracking a vehicle uh, through as it's driving through a city. Works pretty well. You can also derive um, quantities from the position and elevation. You can derive like the speed if you just sort of differentiate uh, in time. And you get the speed as a function of time. So this plot here shows speed changing uh, over time. Um, you can track uh, elevation uh, changes, so that's what I call climb, or you're heading, like are you driving northwest or north or south, uh, and changes in those things. So we can use that to measure when somebody's making a turn, how fast are they making the turn, uh, et cetera. Um, so the, uh, the accuracy of GPS um, varies quite a lot, and that's kind of one of the things you got to keep in mind if you're working with GPS data. Um, from our, uh, so this little plot here I pulled off of Wikipedia um, sort of shows you how uh, your, so GPS works by triangulating your position by communicating with satellites as they're orbiting around. This is showing um, for a particular point on the Earth, uh, depending on you know, the satellite's orbits and the time of day and where you are on the Earth, you connect to different numbers of satellites and that affects the accuracy of your position estimate. Um, also, if you're driving in a tunnel or in a city and your sight line is blocked by buildings or whatever, the accuracy um, can uh, be impacted pretty significantly and you might actually lose data. So we find um, about 6% of samples, you know, we're collecting GPS samples once a second when you drive, um, about 6% of those samples we just, we lose uh, because of um, connectivity issues and, and we just, we don't get good data. So that's a minority of the, the data that we're trying to collect, but it's enough that um, it can have a significant impact on your application. You need to keep it in mind. Uh, and then even when you do get a sample, the accuracy can vary pretty significantly. 99% of the time, it's below 
35 meters, but you can see the accuracy um, can sometimes get out to 100 uh, plus meters. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. Um, so GPS is really good for measuring, I guess, sort of coarse motion um, at the meter level and once a second. Uh, but if you want to understand finer grain motion at higher levels of detail, you need um, additional sensors. So this is the IMU we talked about before. You've got the accelerometer that measures forces applied to the phone. Gyroscope measures rotation, um, and particularly the rate of rotation. And the magnetometer measures magnetic field, and all the measurements are made relative to the phone in, these sort of co in this coordinate system that's fixed to the phone. Um, so these sensors are, in, in modern smartphones, are very good. The, their noise is very low. Um, they're usually calibrated pretty well. And um, you can sample up to 100 times a second. So for certain applications, like crash detection, for instance, this is a trace of accelerometer data throughout a crash. The crash happens here. Um, and the time axis is kind of uh, hard to see. But the, the main impact, this big pulse, is over and done with in like 100 milliseconds. So if you were only making measurements once a second or 10 times a second, even, um, you'd kind of miss the important details of what happened during that impact. So, um, and you know, with this kind of data, we also get fidelity of what happened during the crash, but also we can see before the crash, there's about a 1G uh, acceleration. This is the person slamming on their brakes right before they get into an impact. So there's a lot of richness in this data that we can use to figure out, okay, a crash happened, but also what, what happened during the crash, just from the sensor data. Um, so um, some things to know about the, uh, the IMU. Um, on mobile platforms, you can request the IMU data in kind of two forms. There's one that I call here the raw form, and another that I'll call, the, I'll call the processed form. The raw, I've got it in quotes because it's not really like, if you've worked, I don't know, it's not really like raw voltages or whatever that you have to completely calibrate from scratch. It's had some basic level of calibration applied. But um, uh, there are still some artifacts that you'll, in some applications, you'll really want to remove. And so the operating system tries to remove these artifacts for you. So for the accelerometer, um, the accelerometer is measuring forces applied to the phone, including the constant force of gravity. And in some applications, you really don't want that force of gravity in your data. Um, it can be much larger, for instance, you know, gravity measures at 1G, and if you're trying to measure if somebody's braking, you know, coming to a stop at a stoplight, that's like a fraction of a G. So um, gravity kind of swamps a lot of the signals that you might be interested in, in pulling out of the data, so you want to remove it. And uh, both operating systems, iOS and Android, will do that for you. Um, neither does it that well. Uh, Android really doesn't do it great. Um, raw uh, gyroscope data suffers from uh, bias, and that is to say if you have the phone just sitting still, it's not moving, you don't get zero rotation uh, from the gyroscope. There's some small uh, offset and you want to remove that. It's very important to remove that for certain applications. Some, it's, it's usually a pretty small offset, so for some applications it might not matter. But if you're, especially if you're trying to like integrate the gyroscope to measure change in orientation over time, um, that bias can like destroy um, your estimate very quickly. So you want to remove it. Um, and similarly, the magnetometer has bias and uh, scaling uh, artifacts that you want to remove. So I have these drawn here as three, three boxes, but um, there's actually some black box algorithms that both operating systems apply to the data, and it's not really documented at all what, um, what is going on, what, they're, you know, what algorithms they're applying and what effect it has on your data. And for a lot of applications, um, it's really important to know what artifacts you're sort of imparting on your data when you apply these algorithms. So we've done a fair amount of work to, uh, to understand what these algorithms uh, are doing and to sort of reverse engineer them. Um, so it's really kind of like one or maybe two algorithms that are fusing all of this raw data together to produce 
the calibrated um, or processed data sources. And as a, a sort of a byproduct, but as a very important byproduct, they also produce an estimate of the attitude, or uh, that is to say the orientation of the phone relative to the Earth, uh, like north, northwest, up coordinate frame. Um, so I'll talk about that black box algorithms. I'll sort of shine some light into that block, black box a little bit. On iOS, we have learned that um, they're using uh, an algorithm known as a Kalman filter to do, um, to do this uh, fusion and processing um, process. Is anybody familiar with Kalman filtering? Okay, some people. Um, the Kalman filter is uh, an algorithm that you can use. So it's a, it's a signal processing technique that you can use to um, combine together data that you have uh, about, you know, you're measuring some, some uh, state of a, of, a, of a thing. In this case, I'll take the gravity estimate as an example. We want to, as a function of time, um, get an estimate of the direction of gravity relative to the phone's coordinate frame. So that, that is a state that we want to track over time, and we can directly measure that state using the accelerometer. Um, it's a noisy measurement, but it is a direct measurement of the gravity applied to the phone. We can also, if we know the gravity vector at some point in time, we can uh, sort of propagate the estimate of the gravity vector over time using the gyroscope, because the gyroscope tells us how the phone is rotating, and the only thing that is uh, changing the um, gravity relative to the phone is that rotation. So if we can integrate the gyroscope um, signal, we can, in principle, tell you, you know, starting from a point where we know the gravity vector, we can tell you what the gravity vector looks like for all time. Um, but these are both noisy measurements. And so the Kalman filter provides a framework for combining these two noisy estimates together in a self-consistent way to give you sort of like the best uh, fused estimate of what the gravity vector is. So iOS does this using a, a nonlinear sort of variant of the Kalman filter. I've applied it, uh, what's called an unscented Kalman filter. Um, the blue line here is my estimate of gravity, and the orange line, which is right, mostly right on top of it, is the iOS's uh, estimate. So I'm pretty confident that this is what they're doing. Um, it's, uh, they're, and they're using this not just for estimating gravity, but for doing bias, gyroscopic bias. So. Um, the Kalman filter, you're sort of integrating the gyroscope, and as I mentioned, if you have bias in there, that goes wrong really quickly. But as a result, the Kalman filter, you can sort of put in the gyro bias as one of your states that you want to estimate, and you can estimate it over time uh, as well. So this, and then one, and also, you put the magnetometer in there. Magnetometer tells you where north is, and you know where gravity is pointing, so that's down. And so if you have north and down, then you can construct east and west so that also gives you the relative orientation of the phone uh, to the Earth. So the Kalman filtering kind of handles all of this for you. There are ways to improve upon what um, iOS does, I think. Um, and particularly, so Android doesn't do this same thing. They, I don't know exactly what they do, but um, an important thing to note about the processed uh, Android data is that it removes sort of slowly varying acceleration signals. So if, say you're um, driving around a highway on-ramp. This is a very long, sort of constant, slow acceleration. Um, and if you look at the processed Android data, that acceleration profile would just be completely removed. They do some kind of high-pass filtering to sort of filter out the, uh, the gravity from the data. So I would, for some applications, it's really not a good idea to use their processing. Um, the magnetometer uh, calibration is, um, if you've ever used like the Compass app on your phone, this is sort of a screenshot of the Compass app, you, you have to like rotate your phone around a little bit. And the reason for that is that the main thing that corrupts the magnetometer data that you have is, um, you know, the magnetometer is measuring magnetic fields and that's magnetic fields generated by anything, including the phone itself. So there's some sort of device uh, constant 
magnetic distortion from all the electronics and metal in the device, and you want to filter that out and remove it. Um, and that device-specific um, sort of calibration artifact uh, doesn't change as you change the orientation of your phone, but the external magnetic field that you presumably actually want to measure does change. So if you rotate your phone around, um, uh, the external magnetic field should basically be swirling around on the surface of a sphere, whereas your the device sort of corruption is a constant offset from uh, zero in the XYZ plane in, in, um, of the uh, sensor. And so you can do the calibration by fitting a sphere to some data that you've collected as you change the orientation of the phone, remove the, uh, the, the center of the sphere, you subtract from your data, and you can sort of rescale the data so that it um, fits on the constant radius of the sphere. And so that's the calibration that's done to the magnetometer. It's really important because the, the um, biases that are introduced from the sort of electronics in the device itself are very strong. Um, so the data without calibration is kind of useless. Um, one of the biggest challenges working with mobile phone data is a fractured uh, Android uh, marketplace. So, uh, and this is true uh, for any developer working with mobile phones. Um, iOS, the sensor data since about iOS 5, the, the iPhone 5S, the sensor data has all been really consistent. Um, it has the same sort of specifications, and I, uh, the iPhones all have um, a coprocessor co co on them for processing sensor data, so it's highly reliable. It's not going to get interrupted by some other process going on in your phone. Um, on Android, though, it's, it's an open marketplace, um, and that's, that's cool, but you don't have that kind of reliability, and, and you have to plan for a lot of variations. So sensor specifications can be very different. Um, there are thousands of different makes, and who knows what's going on with some of them. Um, but uh, one of the things that can be a really critical factor is that um, some phones don't have gyroscopes or magnetometers. They all have uh, accelerometers. But um, that will make it so that you can't, um, like certain applications, for instance, virtual reality, just doesn't work on those phones. Um, uh, an attitude estimate that we were talking about you know, using a Kalman filter, incorporating gyroscope data to, to do that and make that work, you can't really do that if you don't have a gyroscope. So, um, and it's a quarter of the user base in our uh, data set. Um, and then like the accelerometer for crash detection, high acceler, we're kind of really looking for big spikes in acceleration, large forces applied to the phone. And uh, there's variation in the range of the accelerometer data that you can get. Um, anywhere from 2 to 16 G. iOS, it's always 8 G per axis. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, so I'll get into uh, machine learning. So machine learning uh, with mobile sensing has been, in the past, I, th I think it kind of has lagged a lot of other um, uh, sort of domains, like image processing or, or audio processing. Part of that, I think, is because you want to be able to apply, if you have some use case or application, you want to be able to apply it on the device in a lot of cases. And until fairly recently, that was not a, it wasn't very feasible to do that, to apply like a, a big neural network or something on device in real time with low power and low latency. Um, but, so Apple, the iPhone uh, 10 recently, they've packed a bunch of more sensors in this controversial little uh, bar at the top of the screen. Um, with a particular um, uh, machine learning application of facial detection, right? So, um, and you're, they're using facial detection to unlock your phone, which has to happen quickly, and you're doing it a bunch of times during the day, so it can't be a battery drain. So um, to sort of facilitate this operation, uh, Apple has put this thing called the Neural Engine. It's a coprocessor that is uh, designed to run uh, neural networks efficiently on the device. And they've also released an SDK, I'll talk a little bit about that later, so that you can very easily apply machine learning algorithms very efficiently on device. So this is a fairly recent development. 
And it has huge implications for people looking to do like image and audio processing. I think that's kind of the top of mind, obviously, with facial recognition. But for mobile sensing, um, I think this is going to sort of open the floodgates of you know, making it so that machine learning and deep learning are sort of more feasible for uh, mobile sensing applications on, on the device in particular. Um, so there are kind of three different approaches. This is generally true, but for mobile sensing, there are three different, I guess, classes or categories of algorithms that you'll see. Um, historically, it's, the field has been kind of dominated by what I'm calling physics-based or sort of heuristic algorithms. This is, you know, think of this as, um, you know, I want to measure, uh, uh, you know, hard braking. I want to make a detector to know if somebody's braking hard as they come to a stoplight. I don't really need anything too fancy to do that because I've got an accelerometer and it tells me how hard people are accelerating. So I can, um, in principle, just sort of do some signal processing and, and get a good result there. Um, and for that, you really kind of don't need much data to design effective algorithms. Um, uh, for some applications, um, particularly applications where um, at, this, at this point in time where getting data can be very expensive and difficult, I think crash detection, it's kind of hard to come by that data, it turns out. Um, people don't want, I've asked people, they don't want to crash their cars for me. Um, so there, I think traditional machine learning techniques uh, have a really still good place in, in this uh, domain. You need you know hundreds or maybe thousands of examples, and you can do a lot of really amazing things. Um, and then in some cases, you know, deep learning becomes really a viable option, and especially now that you can run deep learning models on device, um, where you might need thousands or tens of thousands or more uh, examples. But it's possible to come by like you know these devices are fairly inexpensive and. Um, the data, it's pretty small relative to image and audio. So, um, you know, you can build up pretty big data sets. You have to be really careful about it. I'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, deep learning is a viable option. So, um, a little bit more detail into each of these options. The sort of heuristic models, signal processing techniques are really critical. My colleague Keith Santarelli gave a talk on that earlier this morning. Um, if you didn't go, uh, and look for those uh, afterwards. Um, and, you know, another consideration for, um, I mean, I mentioned it before, but in some, some use cases, uh, these types of models are really the only thing that you can feasibly work with, like consider a Fitbit. It's a small, you don't have a lot of computing uh, power on the device, so they can't, you know, do anything too crazy for measuring steps and things like that. Um, but you can also do that really successfully using, you know, careful design of signal processing uh, tech, uh, algorithms and knowing your, your system and sort of the physics of the system really well. You can design really effective algorithms. So, um, and then also, I guess here, if you want to build an algorithm to detect people doing donuts in a parking lot or, what, or whatever, um, you know, s signal processing techniques and, and heuristic models work pretty well. Um, so for machine learning, um, some, uh, in general, some basic considerations, uh, you're usually going to want to be working with like some windowed form of data. You know, you might be taking one second chunks of data or 10 second or minute long chunks of data and then doing some feature extraction. <clears throat> Often you'll still want to be doing some signal processing to filter out noise or filter out, um, you know, like the gravity removal uh, thing that I talked about earlier, like in some cases you, that can really be a problem, so you want to remove gravity from your data. You may also want to change reference frames, so for some things, if you're measuring motion relative to the ca a car, for instance, or relative to a person's body, the data that you're collecting is in the reference frame of the phone, but if you know how the phone is oriented relative to this other thing, you know, a car or a person's body or whatever it is, you'll want to apply some rotation so that you get the data in the appropriate reference frame. It makes things sometimes really better, uh, a lot better. Um, and then for feature extraction, you'll do some common things in um, time series uh, analysis, measure, taking statistical measures. A lot of times there's periodic behavior you want to capture, so you'll do some Fourier uh, transformation and extract coefficients. 
Um, I just want to plug here, I'm not involved with this project at all, but I use it and it's kind of cool. There's a Python package called TS Fresh that's, it makes it really easy to um, sort of apply one function and extract hundreds of uh, features from time series data that you can then input into your machine learning model of choice, you know, logistic regression or random forest or whatever it is. Um, so check out TS Fresh if you've never used it before. I, I like it a lot. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about deep learning. Here you don't need to do uh, as much pre-processing, just basic um, you know, windowing, windowing or resampling so that you have data on a, a regular time grid. So just doing some interpolation basically. Um, and uh, you may still find it, I've found in the past um, for my applications, transforming into another basis can still be helpful. Um, for instance, if you have something that you're trying to pick out that is, you know that it has some periodicity to it, transforming your data into the Fourier domain or the frequency domain can be pretty effective. In that case, you know, <clears throat> if you have some intuition that that's a better representation for your data, your neural network doesn't have to learn that, you can just do it. Um, uh, so data augmentation I've found can be really, I mean, uh, this is generally true, but um, it's very effective in this case. And in some um, applications, it's really critical because some data that you'll collect from a smartphone will have um, signatures of the phone itself sort of in calibration artifacts or like device specific, you know, sort of noise profiles or things like that. In your neural network, say you have, there was a paper that was put out by a group at Google that was trying to um, take uh, sensor data from people's sort of daily activity uh, with their phones, whatever they were doing, and trying to basically train a, an algorithm that would be able to identify the person using um, data just collected from the phone in this way, um, sort of for a sec you know, security kind of application. And um, they found that without data augmentation, the algorithm was just sort of learning to identify the phone that the person was carrying and not the behaviors of the person itself. So they had to add noise to the data to get anything like reasonable results. Um, uh, I've found applying random rotations for some things can be really useful. Say you have accelerometer data from a bunch of crashes. I want to be able to detect a crash no matter how the phone's oriented in the car. So if I've got an example of data and then I just apply a rotation to the accelerometer data, for instance, it still looks, it still should look like a crash that I want to detect. So I can apply a bunch of random rotations and get, it sort of gives me more data, but the power of that is it makes it so that your networks uh, are more generalizable, which is important. You can also apply translations and things like that. Uh, applying rotations in some cases won't be effective because in some, some settings the orientation of the device is important, so you don't really want to rotate things without thinking about it. And then so people apply different uh, architectures um, for mobile sensing. Uh, convolutional neural networks, um, kind of all of deep learning for mobile sensing is fairly new. There's not a ton of, of literature. And what people are doing, they're mostly trying to like apply techniques that have been effective in image processing for sensors. And in some cases that works pretty well, and in some cases, you know, it's, it's not as effective. So I think there's a lot of headroom for, for research here, but um, people do find some, a lot of success with convolutional neural networks in some uh, applications, and um, sort of recently people have been using these hybrid architectures I'll talk about in a minute. Um, recurrent neural networks people do use, but um, I don't know, I, I've found typically CNNs are a little bit um, more effective. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some considerations for, I'll focus on CNNs here but some architectural considerations is sort of high level. You have a lot of different options for how you can construct your input to the network. Um, and in some applications, different options work better. So one thing you can do, so imagine you've got um, a problem where you want to take data from two sensors, a gyroscope and an accelerometer, and you want to build a classifier based on the gyroscope and the accelerometer. Um, you can, for each one of the sensors, you have an X, Y, and a Z time series. So you could take those and you could just concatenate them into one big long vector. Um, that's usually 
uh, not the best thing to do. Um, an alternative is you can take the data so that you have it um, in a, like a two-dimensional array, where one dimension is the time axis and the other dimension is, you can think of it if you've ever done like deep learning for images, um, people often use like the red, green, blue uh, channels of an image as um, sort of a stacked 2D uh, representation of the image. And so you can do the same thing here where you've got sort of one time dimension and then another dimension for the different channels, either for different sensors or one sensor. And then you can apply convolutions. You can either treat that 2D representation as like a flat image and apply a convolution across both axes, or you can do a 1D convolution just along the time axis. Some authors have found advantages to doing it one way or the other. Um, it seems to me like f using convolutions across the channel axis would allow you to find features where there's correlations between different axes. Um, so there's probably some advantage there. Um, uh, you know, then you have some sequence of convolutional layers. I find that you don't typically need to have as many as you do in image processing. You can do things with you know, a few layers uh, pretty effectively. Pooling, um, you can of course add pooling layers in between. Um, that's where you take you know, maybe like two or three time samples and just take like the max in a, in a sliding window and take the max value in each sliding window to sort of downsample along the time axis. I found that's actually detrimental in a lot of mobile sensing applications. Um, it's, people do it a lot in image processing, but, um, and then, uh, you know, you flatten and concatenate the output of your convolutional layers down and then have some dense layers that go to an output. Um, and if you need to regularize, you can put dropout layers in there. An alternative is to use very similar type of, um, a similar type of architecture for a single sensor and then to have, so basically to have two separate um, networks for each of your sensors and then have them combine down into, you know, concatenate them into a combined dense layer. You might have a couple of more uh, convolution layers um, after you do the concatenation as well. Um, and this is, uh, this is advantageous because you can learn sort of sensor specific features in each one of these networks. And then once you combine them together, you can, um, you can learn correlations between sensors maybe more effectively than if you use this representation. So, and then to get a little bit um, more complicated, this is a diagram of one of these hybrid models from a paper called uh, Deep Sense, where you basically have the same architecture that I'm showing here where you have independent sensor uh, networks that combine down into a single combined network. And then you take the output from that and pass it into a recurrent neural network. And for some, say you're doing activity recognition, um, something that's, uh, that we focus on is understanding if somebody's uh, texting while they're driving. So that's kind of a stateful thing. Somebody has, the phone is down on their, in their cup holder, they pick it up, there's a state, the phone is now in your hand, they're texting, they put it back down. So there are different behaviors, like micro behaviors, but that's all one thing that we want to be able to, to detect. And so an RNN can help you sort of keep track of that state. You know, phone picked up, phone in hand, phone put down. Of course, it's an internal representation, but. So you can kind of imagine why combining a convolution, convolutional neural networks and then recurrent neural networks would be effective for mobile sensing um, applications. Uh, so, um, I mentioned before you can deploy models on device. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but there are different options depending on your platform. On iOS, uh, there's something called Core ML. It's fairly new. Uh, on Android, you can use uh, sort of a condensed or, or a, a light version of TensorFlow. You can also use that on iOS, but. Um, so, for Core ML on iOS, there's a Python package that allows you to convert models that you've trained on your laptop or on a, a cloud instance, a GPU instance or something, from a framework that you're probably already using, Keras or um, Scikit-learn or something like that, you can convert those models into a representation that you can just deploy in your iOS app. And then calling the model in iOS is pretty straightforward. Model.prediction, 
you get a prediction out. Um, so it makes it very easy and efficient to sort of add your models to your uh, mobile phone app. Um, so then data is crucial, of course, for all of, for any machine learning. Um, and there are some things to keep in mind when you're collecting data, image processing or audio processing, you can have humans like look at and label your images for you and get a good truth data set. You can't, you can't look at sensor data and make any sense of it though. So you kind of need to collect data very carefully. Context can help. So for our crash detection, um, we went to a crash lab and crashed a bunch of cars with phones in them. And so in that case, we knew, because we were doing controlled experiments, we knew that the phones were, the data we were collecting was from a crash. Um, you can combine uh, sensor data collection with video collection. We have a collaboration with uh, the MIT's Advanced Vehicle Technologies Group where they're doing, um, they are recording video and audio and a bunch of other sensor data for people that have um, cars with uh, advanced vehicle technologies in them like Tesla's. And we can use that uh, data with our mobile phone data to um, validate and uh, train algorithms for, you know, in this case, it's mobile phone detection. Here you see that um, our data, sort, our sensor data uh, synced up with the video data. Um, you can also combine it with other measures of truth from other uh, devices. Um, so that's all I, all I have for you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we still have some minutes. If uh, you have any questions, you can use the mic here. Questions? Okay, so thank you for the amazing presentation. Please put your hands together for uh, Michael Bell. <laughs>